So hello and welcome everyone. Uh, today we have a very special session for you. Three very talented members of the Open Group who are also architects and enterprise architecture consultants at major enterprise companies are going to share an excerpt from our first ever fictional novel from the Open Group, which is about enterprise architects working at a company called Archie Insurance which many of you may remember from previous uh, case studies, which is being, and this is going to be published later this year by the Open Group Press. The inspiration for this novel came as the authors were sharing their own challenges in making the shift to a digital enterprise. And as we've heard throughout the day, they noticed the problems and opportunity they were chasing were all very similar, and so were their solutions. Each one of them had leveraged one or more of the standards of the open group to accelerate and improve their solutions for their business problems. And they also, you know, shared, naturally shared the funny stories about what life is like in the unique world of enterprise architecture, both at work and at home, because work bleeds into home life so often, and their partners had to be equally patient. So from these realizations and linking them to the existing fictional company featured in the Archie Shirts case study originally published by the Open Group Art Committee Forum, the idea of this novel was born. The uh, characters, uh, the authors hope you'll see yourselves, your colleagues, and your challenges in this novel. And hopefully you'll learn a thing or two along the way about how to apply the Open Group standards to developing solution tasks. So the following scene is set at a live event of the Open Group. You know, remember when we had live events, uh, which we missed, uh, where the Open Group president and CEO has invited the company Arch Assurance to come and share their digital transformation success story on the main stage. So welcome to the Open Group event in Edinburgh. It's wonderful to be back live again and in person, isn't it, after uh, all these virtual events? Well, today I have a really special treat for you, I can tell you. Many of you tell me that you like our case study presentations the most and, you know, the ones delivered by people who don't just talk the talk, but have also had to walk the walk, sometimes walking across fire. Many of you have also shared with me that digital transformation and digital product delivery is what is most on the minds of your organization's leaders this year. Well, I'd like to introduce Brad Nelson, President and CEO of Arc Insurance, Dr. Kathleen Stone, Chief Architect, and Nick Ross, Lead Business Architect. They are going to give you their story of digital transformation. I have to say, I was so impressed by all that the company Arc Insurance has achieved that I invited them here to share their real world story of how they kicked off a digital customer intimacy initiative a little over a year ago. They'll share a bit about the how and then what outcomes they've achieved so far. And finally, in a topic near and dear to my heart, they'll also share with you how the Open Group portfolio of open digital standards helped to strengthen and accelerate their digital transformation. So now, would you please give a big warm welcome from the Open Group to Brad, Kathleen and Nick. Thank you, Steve. Yeah, yes, it's uh, been quite a journey and we're pleased with how it's going. So uh, what we like to do before we talk about outcomes is to go right back to highlight our aims and expectations from the start. Uh, we've just been through a merger of three companies into one. Um, after all the streamlining of processes and rationalization of systems that was done during the merger, we actually felt we'd made some good strides in becoming an agile organization. However, analysis showed we hadn't really gone beyond the implementation of agile development. Or as Amy Lee, our external consultant, we hired indicated, we implemented actual ceremonies. That's it. It wasn't really deaf and dot, let alone being a transformed to a digital organization. In fact, instead of being agile, we started to lose grip on the budget. So being honest to ourselves, we recognized we hadn't changed much more than the instructional scrumming as a way to develop software. We have kept ourselves, uh, everything else, uh, pretty much as the same as before. So now it was time to really transform the whole organization, get our core operational values in order with cross-functional teams that work together. We simply didn't know how and where to start. As it turned out, luckily enough, around the time Kathleen reached out to Dick Masterson, our CIO, and without knowing our conclusions for a need to transform, she provided us with an approach, which we actually decided to embrace. In just a few weeks, she and her team engaged with all the business leaders and developed the details of the approach which she, and she's with us today, presented to the whole company. 
I will never forget this town hall meeting. I really felt we were turning the company around. I had the honor to present our ideas and get everybody on board. I knew I still had to convince some who were cynical about change and others who thought they might lose the empires they had built. So I got on the stage and I asked everyone to close their eyes to imagine. To imagine that we work for a company that has broken down all functional silos. In this company, we work together across value streams and are accountable for achieving common goals and objectives that each team has a shared funding model. Business value is delivered on all technology investment decisions, that customers are happy with their experience, that our company has mastered the use of agile practices from strategy all the way through execution and operations, and that in this company, the information technology department is no longer simply taking orders from the business. IT has a seat at the table with the business and is seen as a strategic partner. There's no business or IT, they're one and the same. And strategy development is not just a once a year occurrence. Instead, business and IT work hand in hand continuously to make incremental improvements. And we control the products and the supporting backbone that we need to deliver value digitally. The result is a team of teams capable of delivering our products on time with the quality and innovation that delights our customers. We had already identified some of the gaps due to a high level assessment that was completed at the end of the previous year. For example, in our ability to execute digital customer management and data driven insurance product offerings. To inform our business architecture, we carried out an environmental scan with our stakeholders using a questionnaire to assess strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats. Then we brought the stakeholders together to synthesize all of the information collected. As you can see, we also completed a personal analysis to get a sense of all of the external factors influencing our environment. We also used an organization map to improve our understanding of the organization and the context for strategic planning, deployment, communication, and collaboration. To work even more agilely, we plan the team structure to enable the teams to be autonomous and self-organizing, each able to make decisions. The aim being to minimize dependency on other teams to create flow and drive value. You know what? We don't have to imagine anymore. Arch Assurance is a digital enterprise. Our budgets are aligned to the value streams, and which helps us to make good investment choices holistically, instead of in our functional silos, with everyone working on the common goals and outcomes. In fact, our silos have broken down so much that redundancy and duplication is almost non-existent. We are agile in our digital product development from the creation of an idea all the way to operations. And best of all, and this is what makes me most happy, our customers are really happy. We no longer get complaints about being transferred from department to department. Actually, we now hear from our customers that they are happy with our service, and that they get immediate support that they're looking for. We also have people process with technology in place for continuous shared customer insight. In other words, we're in touch and in tune with our customers. We did this by using an outside aim view, making our customers the key stakeholders. We owe a large part of our success to the open group standards. The TOGAF standard was used as our architecture method for determining the work to be done. The IT for IT standard was used to enhance the flow of the work and to ensure the capture of service and product lifecycle deliverables. We used the Archimate standard for modeling the vision business, information systems, and technology architectures. The digital practitioner body of knowledge standard helped the organization develop digital skills and establish an agile and DevOps compatible operating model. And finally, we used the open agile architecture standard to guide the transformation of the architecture capability to become lean and agile. All these standards really gave us a map for our digital journey. 
There was also a lack of communication between groups because the systems had been built independently of each other. We were able to narrow things down to having four core systems with integration between each one so that the information would flow from one system to the next, which has eliminated the manual re-entry of data and reduced cycle times. The data objects for the digital product backbone stored in each of the four systems are the thread that creates traceability from portfolio to operations. We hope to eventually have one centralized systems, but for now, the integrations are working well. I'd like to walk you through some of the deliverables. I cannot say enough about our, the work that our business architects did to frame what we needed to do. As I mentioned before, we use the Open Group TOGAF standard to guide us, as well as the stream, extremely helpful TOGAF series guides. The business architects spent several weeks interviewing different types of stakeholder groups, gathering the pain points, the concerns, the ambitions, and the dreams related to the current situation and understanding of their vision and objectives. This information was used to characterize the baseline state and to create a capability heat map to work out our gaps with the target state all within the context of an end-to-end -end value stream. Identifying gaps led to opportunities and solutions that were prioritized, and from that, we created our roadmap. The result was four big accomplishments, which together have helped make us a digital company. We completed an application rationalization to simplify our environment. We created a digital product pipeline that keeps work flowing and traceable from strategy to operations. We deployed new technology in support of our digital product products. And finally, we established agile governance methods to guide future digital product endeavors. Here I've summarized our successes and lessons learned. The biggest lesson was that there is an enormous amount of work that needs to be done to become a digital enterprise, and much of that work has nothing to do with technology. People and lines of communication are equally as important as the technology. Value streams and working end-to-end -end with cross-functional teams has been one of our keys to success. I want to share our digital customer intimacy roadmap with you. It really shows the journey. We color coded it so you can clearly see where we use the TOGAF and IT for IT standards. The TOGAF standard in yellow and the IT for IT standard in blue. We started strategic planning with the business in Q4. It was the first time IT had a seat at the table with a business. The strategy discussions were so successful that it's now second nature for IT and business to work together. The best part about co-creating the strategy as a regular cadence is that the work outlined during strategy sessions gets automatically carried forward into DevSecOps because they also have a seat at the table. Additionally, when it's time to deploy solutions, the operations group is ready because they've been involved in the strategy sessions and know what is coming down the pike. Strategy is no longer a once a year conversation. The discussion is continuous. You can see on the roadmap also that development of a governance structure was started early in the schedule. This was due to the agility we wanted to achieve with digital product development. We needed to have principles and guardrails established to keep us on track so that the ingrained gating processes did not bog us down. If we were going to eliminate the restrictive gates, we needed to put forward new, more flexible guidelines. The TOGAF standard gave us a methodology for developing architecture runway very quickly for our build iterations. And we established many building blocks and reference architectures that will help us with ongoing initiatives. Getting architectural runways in place faster is something we should have focused on more. We didn't realize how much the architects and strategists needed to work with the business relationship portfolio and DevSecOps teams to keep all the work products in sync continuously and in our agile world. We did not recognize that the architects needed to be at every team synchronization meeting until it was almost too late. So true, Nick. That teamwork was essential to our success. 
Also, governance and change management methods were firmed up early and modifications were, need, were made as needed during each iteration. We were able to implement new guidelines for the architects that made it permissible for them to deliver only the level of granularity needed for each build iteration to speed up the development of our architecture runways. The IT for yes. IT standard for digital really helped us to build our product development tool chain. For example, the strategy portfolio capability map laid out the data linkage required to achieve full traceability from a strategic theme to enterprise architecture, which forms a set of proposals that turn into the portfolio backlog and product backlog. The same was achieved for the other capability groups, requirement to deploy, request to fulfill, and detect to correct, giving full traceability of the product lifecycle by integrating our primary tracking tools. This slide shows the way that we use the TOGAF ADM in the past, where we would create all the artifacts before starting any of our development work. With Agile and the need to build in increments to add value iteratively, we have adjusted to only build enough architecture runway for each minimum viable product, which adds value with each release of a product and promotes continuous improvement. Now this slide shows the core architecture we developed for each iteration in more detail and how the level of completion increases as the shade becomes darker. A through H on each wheel present, represents the phases of TOGAF. So for example, in the first iteration, phase A, which is the future vision, is the most important element to establish with stakeholders. So the shading is darker than the other phases. It becomes the guiding light for all of the teams. Business architecture is shaded a bit lighter, and it also needs to be started early to establish the baseline state. The business architecture will continue to be refined in future iterations as gaps are uncovered in getting to the target state defined by the vision. Requirements and governance are lighter than the business architecture in the early iterations, and they needed to be started as early as well, but not may not be as well formulated until after development begins and a minimum viable product release or two has been completed. Well, uh, as CEO, I actually have no clue what all these standards actually mean, but I'm really happy with the outcome and it really shows the digital journey that we managed to do today. And not only did we deploy this digital capability I'll talk about, but we actually changed our culture and the way of working. And we did get away from those silo teams and we actually create value streams, which you know, actually produce what we need to deliver to our customers. And we, we did that. We had to change not only the, the, the value streams itself, but also the way money was being allocated to functional groups, right, from those functional groups to shared value streams in the funding model. Another big change was that we disabandoned the traditional product methodology and the gating that coincides with that. We need to get to our continuous product lifecycle model. And all these transformations have made us agile and we provided more velocity and we have to have, we take on digital product implementation as a way of doing business and not just on the side. The biggest lift was getting our business work together on the most important objectives across the board, establishing traceability of work products from strategy to operation for everybody. Folks, that was such a great story um, and be glad that you came to share it here with us today. Um, it, congratulations to everyone involved. It's quite a, quite a journey um, and uh, you've, you haven't got to the end of it, I know, but uh, congratulations on where you've got to so far. So as we do here at the Open Group events, I've got some questions from the audience for you. And um, first question aimed at you, Kathleen, I think. How did you get the leadership team to buy into organizing the teams, um, organizing teams across the value streams? Well, that was one of our more difficult culture changes that we made. Uh, we needed to break down the political barriers between the functional groups. Most of the silo thinking was due to established goal and funding structures. Each functional group was responsible for completing their own goals within their own budget which really inhibited working together toward common outcomes. 
Simultaneously, this suppressed cross-functional thinking because each functional silo was only accountable for their part of the product life cycle. This silo way of thinking was creating bottlenecks with work stuck in queues, waiting for each functional group to pass it along to the next. It also re resulted in many duplicate tools being developed to store the same type of product life cycle information. It took a while to get leadership to see the value of working in teams across value streams towards common goals. But it has been tried and proven now with several of our value stream team implementations. We do it one value stream at a time and the benefits speak for themselves as the flow of work increases when teams have the same outcomes they are working to achieve. We also set up an accountability framework where employees are rewarded for working together versus the silo way of working within the boundaries of their own functional group. Okay, Kathleen, thank you. That's great for answering that question. Um, it's you know, a particularly important question concerning digital transformation. Now, I don't think we can say enough about the, the importance of teaming across value streams to work on common outcomes. It's inevitably going to increase the visibility and flow of the work, so thank you. Let me move on to the next question. Uh, this one for you, Nick. Um, I believe you had to deal with an issue caused by unexpected changes in the system. Tell us about that. Yes, uh, we had issues with the operation of the new digital products platform. Our customers began to experience problems accessing their own information and new requests just weren't making it through. To make it worse, the operations team could not get anything out of their monitoring systems. So they were logging in manually to individual servers without access to any centralized information. I set up two incident resolution swarms, one for the product issue and one for the monitoring issue. We checked all deployments done by the teams in the previous 48 hours. Finally, Kathleen, remember, that's when I felt I really had to notify you. I was pretty awkward because you were on vacations and I caught you when you were just arriving at the airport to check in. Sorry again about that, by the way. Yeah, no problem, Nick. You did the right thing letting me know. I knew you had tried everything you could up to that point, including going through all the recent change requests in the system. So that's when we started looking for changes that must have taken place outside the automated approach. Some of them simply just to try to keep up with the rate of change going on. By that time in our conversation, poor Kathleen was just trying to get through airport security. Oh yeah, right. That was hard. And my husband was running out of patience for me. <laughs> then it hit us. The security team had recently released a new version of their security platform. This new system has had its own AI capability and automatically began to apply the highest level of security to identify mission critical systems, including any new monitoring systems which the enterprise architecture team had not been aware of. So I contacted the security team and brought them into the incident swarm and the problem was soon solved. So then we held a post-mortem after the incident. And then as I was looking at the IT for IT capabilities again, it seemed that detect to correct would help us to understand the current state of production to enable a comparison between the actual product instance and the desired product instance to allow the discovery of something implemented outside the approval process and also identify the potential impact of changes by making sure that a register of all changes is maintained in a central repository. We can now track transition states and assess the target state, which gives us much vi better visibility into the architecture change management. Great to hear, thank you. So Brad, you've clearly got everything set up going forward, but as with any company out, out there, you must have been using those monolithic systems which are too big to change and at the same time create a blocker for transformation. How do you solve the issue of those monolithic systems and often legacy systems? A great question, uh, Steve, thanks. But I, I mean, uh, yes, we had one of those. We had uh, BLOS uh, in our case, and actually really worked. Oh. 
Oh, don't you mean the prolongation application? Uh, right. Uh, thanks, Nick. Uh, yes, uh, VLS, PLOS actually was not the official name, uh, but what it was become to known as actually, it called, uh, we called it the big ludicrous old system, PLOS. Um, but as you said, prolongation application is the real name. Uh, this was a system that we marked for replacements many years ago, even before the merger, and it became more and more a form of a liability for us. It was simply not possible to scale any further. We, we took, to, it took it to the end, basically. Unfortunately, we just failed at every attempt of this replacement. It became this collective headache for us all. Ah, yes, I remember this. Every time the team tried to deliver a replacement system, the test cycle found something else the current system was doing that nobody could have predicted. Yeah, right. And, and what it seemed at the time was that everybody needed to wait for this replacement system. Uh, but everybody could see, everybody could actually see, this was not going to happen. It didn't work. And, you know, we had this guy, poor old Hans Pickel, and he <laughs> had the task of replacing this legacy system. It was connected to so many processes, it was just too big to fail. And every time attempt to dismantle the application failed to, failed to deliver. It just became this liability. And our consultant, Amy, I referred to her before, asked whether our big bang approach to replace it all at once was actually the best way to go. Yeah, but we couldn't see any other option. Yes, as Ben, um, Ben Cohen, one of our business analysts pointed out, out, all the data he needed was available in the application. It was just all over the place. There was no API in place to extract data using a query. She realized that regulation had forced a backup of data to be created for all critical systems for business continuity. So it was just a case of checking with the risk management team to see if that data contained the information Ben needed, creating a quick fix. This fix allowed us to develop solutions for their integration as well removing the strain on B on the B L O S. Correct, but it did not solve the real problem of replacing the B L O S. As Amy pointed out, it's not always possible or even the best approach to try and replace something that bit, you know, that big using a big bang. So we did our research and found a concept called strangler pattern, and it's referenced in the open agile architecture standard. It basically means you sometimes have to create room to breathe by slowly strangling something. It allowed us to create space to evolve a replacement behind an API while bypassing the BLOS and still keeping the data in sync. We can't get rid of this BLOS. Huh? Anyway, as I said, poor old Hans Pickle. <laughs> yes, poor old Hans Pickle. I had to replace the architect in his team at least twice. Some of my team even refused to go back there. Yeah, 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 I know, I know. I, he thought I was just trying to make his life even more complicated. He was really not happy and came to see me to want more time and money, you know, go figure. Blaming you actually, Kathleen, for adding all those sort of new requirements. So anyway, anyway, I'm glad to say that Hans has now come to the conclusion that his skills are far better suited for a different project. Well. Sounds like a great result for both Hans Pickle and Art Assurance. So um, good, uh, good outcome there. Thank you all so much for being here today, Brad, Kathleen, and Nick. It means a lot to us here at the Open Group to hear about real successes at our members' companies using the open digital standards developed by our forums and work groups. Uh, we'll see you all back here in a moment for our digital transformation Q&A panel. So uh, don't go away. And that's a wrap. I want to thank our three authors, Steve, for doing this role play from uh, the Turning Point Digital Journey novel. I hope this got you all very excited to read this architecture novel when it gets published by the Open Group Press later this summer. The information is uh, on your screen, so please keep your eye out for that. And uh, now I'm going to invite our other two speakers to uh, join us, uh, turn on their cameras uh, so we can start our final session of the day, which will be a, a Q&A session about uh, digital transformation. Thank you, everyone. Thank you. Thank you all. Indeed. So I don't know. I know. Ah, great. Um, Karina, thank you for joining. I know it's a time zone challenge for, uh, for many people here. 
So uh, let's get started. I'll be looking for any Q and A that's put in the uh, Q and A tool by the in in the uh, WebEx app. Uh, so one thing that struck me in the morning session, there was a lot of emphasis on the need for a new operating model and new organizational ways of working. So how do you all see the role of EAs in driving this change upward and reshaping business models, reshaping operating models? You know, helping with organizational design, helping with you know, team coherence and things like that. Who'd like to go first? Um, I can answer that one. Um, the way I'm seeing, I'm, I'm a business architect at heart, so uh, I am really into value streams and business capabilities and and doing the mapping. Uh, so. I see that we really need to change to more of a value stream model in the way that we work um, instead of in like we talked about in the um, in, in the role play instead of being in our silos, our functional silos, working across the value stream so that things don't fall through the cracks. Any other thoughts on that that, that role that role change for architects? Uh, uh, from what I see is that um, um, you, you can't sit and wait till somebody comes along and ask you a question. You know, you need to be much more um, um, providing a service to the rest of the organization as an as far as architect, uh, and making sure that you get out there in where it actually happens in that value stream. Um, I think for too long we've been really um, holding back and saying you need to come to us and we will you know, serve you with the decision uh, from an arts enterprise. Arts. Yeah, I'm really taking it to the extreme, um, but that's no longer accepted and for good reasons. Uh, and, and since it happens in these value streams, being there and being with the with those people that are actually creating those value streams makes much more sense. And um, you know, the operating model starts to shift towards this. Uh, um, um, uh, working ar along those value streams and, and organized in that same way. So uh, it is where you need to be. Yeah, so that really that emphasis on being embedded and feeling what the uh, product teams feel and deal with on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah, and, and it's not like you need to think of everything up front. Uh, so uh, you, you need to give the guardrails that, that help the organization and, and the autonomous of, uh, autonomy of those decision-making that needs to happen in those value streams need to be guided, but not blocked by uh, by gates and that's the transformation that you need to help the organization make how do you do that how do you make that happen on that point uh, one thing that struck me in the novel was that there's a frequent use of what i will characterize as digital terminology you know terminology that comes from the more recent learnings on um, how we manage uh, product delivery things like you mentioned scrum ritual swarms and uh, do you think it's it's important for EAs to, to speak this new language to be effective in driving organizational change? For me, it does. Yeah, oh, absolutely. Yeah, we even made a point of that in the book that, that there needs to be a coming together of uh, architecture and DevOps. And um, if that doesn't happen, then things go, get, go haywire pretty quick. <laughs> I think what, what is very important also is that everybody speaks the same language and uh, that we, we can create a, a real uh, uh, on all the, the organization and on all the, the whole product life cycle uh, people can understand and share the, the same language and the same name for the, the concept they use. Yep. Well, I'm going to shift tax here a little bit. Um, and I think, do we still have Tony? We may not have Tony. I had a specific question for him. No, we've um, lost Tony, Dave. Sorry. <laughs> unfortunate. Um, so, uh, let's see. Um, you know, we've, we've stressed the importance of, in, in, again, in the morning session, we stressed the importance of the product team and team of team effectiveness in a digital enterprise. Um, you know, how do you see, and the IT for IT model spends a lot of time talking about data flows. And we heard about data um, governance from Arthur. How do you see good data governance supporting the effectiveness of a digital organization? And how can these uh, 
all these different teams be encouraged to use good governance so they have the good data to work on. Guess anybody answers? Oh, go ahead, Sylvan. <laughs> uh, I, I, I don't know. I think uh, what is most important, and, and I experienced this in, a, in a, one of my customers currently, is that we need to simplify um, the way the data is uh, is handled by all the, the systems. Uh, and probably this will be part of the data governance that, that will help to uh, to be more oriented on the data and and maybe less on the on the applications and less on the system uh, that, that was uh, the case before so probably this is how i see uh, that the, the data governance can help um, to be a more uh, more digital and to be a more uh, oriented on the simplifying the the way that we move to, to a product orientation uh, probably will will also simplify the way we manage the data in the enterprise. What, what I've noticed too is that because of the way that a lot of companies have been organized around functional silos, we've tended to have end up with disparate systems a lot of times and redundant systems that are doing the same thing. So that's why I like business architecture a lot because you can start looking at the capabilities across many functions and start seeing where there's duplication of inform uh, of not only information but roles and processes as well and tools and um, i think that's why ap application rationalization is so important when you're starting to build your foundation for for digital um, because then you can start eliminating some of those disparate systems and then the information automatically starts flowing once you have you know your core systems that you're bringing your data through the enterprise architect plays a really important role to, to speak to the part about encouraging different groups to have good data governance and that enterprise architects can actually communicate the way that data fits in in many different places and that it's not just data governance as data governance for its own sake, but enterprise architects can also show how it fits into application integrations and value chains and all of these other areas. Uh, I agree. Uh, I mean, um, as with any governance, uh, as soon as you start to implement gates or something like that, it doesn't start to uh, support the organization that much anymore. So it needs to be good enough uh, to to manage the, uh, the, the 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 flow of data across the systems. Uh, but it doesn't. You also need to be aware that you're not uh, to do governance for the governance sake. If I may uh, say it like that, it needs to be uh, just enough to to guide that uh, the organization. That, that kind of uh, lean, lean thinking and not trying to get it all done up front, as you said earlier. Mm -hmm. It's a shame Tony's not with us. Um, uh, one of the things that struck me about his presentation was he noted the uh, value of rationalization and what I would call digitization or the PP Bach calls digitalization in, in bringing together all of the, uh, the components of, of their enterprise. And he noted the budget savings as, as the, a big outcome of that. And so one of the things I kind of wonder is what sort of business or operating model changes can result from this kind of architecture rationalization? Does, does doing that kind of rationalization of your enterprise help you uh, or enable you to change your, your business and operating models more effectively? You know, how a customer interactions change, you know, in the novel, we talked about the customers increase in customer satisfaction. Is all of the digitization and rationalization a necessary precursor to that kind of a, an outcome? I have to say absolutely, because of, like I said before, all of the redundancy that's been created in a lot of our environments because of the, you know, these functional silos, um, you've got, you know, different functions that are creating applications outside of core applications a lot of times. And 
once you start that rationalization effort, you start seeing where there's all this redundancy. And when you get that out of your environment, you start getting it out of your environment, then things simplify. So you, you, you um, greatly reduce the complexity in your environment. And so I, I really do think it's an important foundational thing that people need to do for digital. Good. Any other thoughts on that? We're probably coming up on our uh, our limit here. So, final thoughts on on the uh, rationalization. Yeah, I, I think if you can't uh, transform as an organization and 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 and, and thinking you know, uh, products that you deliver to customers and how IT is not just a side effect of doing business, but really something that is part of the business and part of the value stream. Uh, you can't even keep up with what the customers are demanding going forward. So it's not, it's not even a question if you need to do it. It's a question of survival for most companies. I think rationalization has to happen on an ongoing basis too, because things start creeping back in. So you just have to constantly be, you have to, you know, have to have those guardrails in place to, um, you know, not not have all the duplication creep back in once you've done the application rationalization. It's ongoing. Karina, Sylvain, any final thoughts on that? Oh, I think uh, rationalization is probably a prerequisite to uh, to do to to do a smooth uh, transformation on, on the mm -hmm. digital enterprise because uh, to to begin to develop a digital product, uh, you need to have a, a simplified organization. And, and if you have a too, too much complex organization and too much complex uh, information system, uh, it will become much more difficult to uh, do a, a good uh, a good digitalization and to, uh, to have really a valuable products for customers. Karina, anything to add? Thing that I've found um, valuable on that point, um, kind of um, going off of what Stephanie was saying about those continued processes and those continued guardrails, I find that when there are algorithms supporting some of that analysis and dashboards that help with really presenting that so that stakeholders can see that decision making as it's happening and contribute to that and have that insight visible. Um, I find that to be um, something that leads to more success for enterprise architect, uh, ar architecture teams to be able to continue that effort instead of seeing it as just a one-time mm -hmm. effort. Great. Well, I want to yep. One last thought. I just wanted to say I completely agree with what Corrine just said, that that, that visibility is, is really essential. Great. Well, I want to thank all our panelists here, Corinna, Sylvain, Keith, uh, Stephanie, of course, and so, uh, and really looking forward to the publication of that novel. And so with that, I'll wind up this session and hand it back to Steve. Thanks very much, Dave, and uh, thanks to all our, our panelists and the, uh, yeah, the, the novel segment was, was a bit of fun, wasn't it? Enjoyed that. Um, but there's some some really great messaging and really great experience gone into that. So yes, do look for the novel. Um, that's it for for today, folks. Thanks to all the all the speakers. Um, as I said at the beginning, a quart in a pint pot. We really had a lot of content to uh, to get through today, and uh, uh, I'm sure some of it uh, at least will uh, be worth revisiting uh, in the uh, when the when the recordings come out. So. Um, do do uh, go back over that. We thank you to all the speakers, and most of all, thank you to all of you attendees who have uh, hung in there um, at all sorts of different time zones. I know um, it's uh, it's great to have you with us, and uh, I do want to thank one final thank you for our sponsors this week: um, Evolution, Irwin, Mega, the Association of Enterprise Architects, and Van Haren Publishing. Um, thank you for your support. And wherever you are in the world, folks, um, uh, be safe and be well, and uh, look forward to seeing you again soon. We will leave the 
uh, uh, the chat function. We'll leave the meeting open if any of you want to exchange some last messages in the chat or any any feedback to us. And uh, as I say, thank you for your for your attention. I hope you found it a valuable use of time. Uh, we certainly did. And um, see you next time. Bye bye.